Hello, Phil Croshaw again from Passions, and this is part one of a fantastic interview with conservation legend Ian Redmond. It really is one to enjoy. So this is a beautiful little seed bed. It's a pile of elephant dung packed with nutrients and seeds, which for the past few weeks has been sitting on the forest floor in the rain. As you can see, there are several species of plant growing out of it. If you look around this forest, most of the species of trees in tropical forests in Africa and Southeast Asia uh, and Latin America depend on animals to disperse their seeds. I often talk about Gorillas being the gardeners of the forest, and chimpanzees and orangutans, in fact all the primates, in fact all the animals that eat fruit. And of course the biggest animal that eats fruits is the elephant. That's why they've been described as the mega gardeners of the forest. And that's why ivory poaching isn't just a crime against elephants, it doesn't just cause unimaginable suffering and, and cruelty to families of elephants, intelligent social mammals, the adults of which, each of whom has a brain four times the size of a human brain, that's bad enough, but where elephants are being driven to local extinction, where forests like this that depend on elephants to disperse the seeds, particularly of the trees with large seeds, seeds that can't pass through a smaller animal, they need elephants. Now these forests are carbon stores, they're oxygen generators, they're rainfall producers, and without the elephants and the other animals that eat fruit and disperse seeds, these forests are dying. That's why when you look at ivory poaching statistics, when you think of the crime of killing an animal for its front teeth, you have to think not just of the cruelty and suffering to the animal and its family, but also to the effect you're having on the planet as a whole. Okay, and a very warm welcome to Passions. And in this episode, I can honestly say it's an absolute pleasure to be welcoming the legend that is Ian Redmond to the show. I'm so, sorry I'm to embarrass you, Ian, but, but you kind of are in this arena. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking to Ian today about lots of different topics, about his passions and the drivers behind his passions. So Ian will do a lot better job than me than introducing himself. So Ian, very warm welcome to Passions. Tell us what your passion is and what you do. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Uh, I think my, my passion is life. Uh, in wow. All, in all its shapes and forms. Um, so uh, my, my, what, my, in a nutshell, description of my work is that I'm, I'm a naturalist by birth. Uh, I think naturalists are just kind of strange people who are fascinated by all life forms and they can't do much about it. Um, I don't think you can train a naturalist, well, you can train a naturalist to, to make them a, a better scientist, but that <laughs> wonder for, that, that reaction of wonder to, to living things is something which um, I, I guess probably everyone's born with, but most people grow out of, and some of us are lucky enough not to grow out of it. So um, a naturalist by birth, a biologist by training, because um, I, I didn't follow my, my 
mum's hope and advice um, and get into vet school. I didn't get the A-level grades. Uh, so <laughs> I ended up studying biology um, at Keele University. And biology and bio means life. Um, so the ology of life is the study of life. Uh, and then a conservationist by necessity. I often describe myself as a reluctant conservationist. I never wanted to be a conservationist. Um, <laughs> but when the species that you're studying are being killed by people who, who are just other people who also were probably born with a wonder for all life and then grew out of it and ended up killing animals to um, make a living, then, then well, f first with the gorillas and then 10 years later with the elephants that I was studying, um, it, it was a very strong personal resolve to do something about it and uh, try and make the world a safer place for, for apes and elephants and, and other life forms. Um, and I haven't finished yet, so, uh, <laughs> but if, if we were to get to that happy stage where, where apes and elephants had a decent chance of growing up and living to a ripe old age uh, or dying of natural causes, then I would go back to just being a naturalist and, and being excited by what they are and what they do and, and how they interact with each other and um, and that experience because I think passions are often driven by a, an innate desire but then an external experience and when you've had wonderful experiences sure you want to go back and have more <laughs> I think actually, I think uh, that description, I need to take that and put that in the description of what the channel's all about, because it's very well, very well articulated and uh, a very a really unique way of, of, of putting it. So well, you say that's not fault because I never thought about uh, how to explain my passion. But, <laughs> well, that, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? It's, in, it's, it's something that people think and even that people that are coming on the show in advance of it, they've said to me, I, I suddenly thought, where did it come from? What makes me passionate about this and and not take us plane spotting or train spotting or whatever, all the millions of passions that there are. So you talk about it as, as, as kind of almost like it's um, natural to you and you were almost like born like this. Is Do you think there's an element, if there's a, any kind of DNA element here? I mean, what was the family connection with conservation, if, if anything? Um note in a word yeah uh my, my mum was a teacher and so she instilled in me a, a, a curiosity a love of knowledge and and whether we were walking down a street and she's pointing out the, the architectural <coughs> trim on the building across the road or um encouraging me to to explore nature and then tolerating me as a child bringing nature into my bedroom as children are wont to do um and, and that, yeah, that was that was that was a good start. Um, uh, my my parents were separated, so I didn't have a sort of paternal influence as a as a child. Although I get on very well with my old man now. <laughs> and, uh, good. Um, but he he was in the army. He was a, a pharmacist in the army, and uh, and in his spare time wrote pantomimes and and plays. Um, so he he is probably a an explanation for whatever theatrical flair I might have. <laughs> all, so, all my siblings are musicians, so I'm the one um, Redmond who, of this generation who, who doesn't make a living out of music or performing, except that I do perform because I do enjoy speaking to live audiences and that interaction with an audience. So I, I think actually one of the keys to my passion is communication. Mm. Because they get a real buzz out of communicating with, with other beings, whether they're human beings or non-human beings. And that's where I think that for a lot of people, you start to, oh, you mean, yeah, human being, you tend to think of as almost one word. But of course, it's two words, human being. And if there's a human being, well, what about the beings who aren't human? And that's where my, you know, the fickle finger of fate steered me towards working with getting to know, and I would say befriending and, and having a mutual friendship where they're as interested in me as I am in them and as comfortable in my presence as I am in their presence with with uh, beings who happen not to be human, but they're very definitely beings. Wonderful. Love that. I love that. Um, so was there a point when you look back, was there a point to, in your education where you thought, I want this to be my career? Can you remember <laughs> that time or... Yes, well, I, I, I 
almost take exception to that word career. Yeah. Because I don't feel I've had a career. Um, stuff happens and I just try and keep up. <laughs> <laughs> and it hasn't yeah. stopped happening and I haven't yeah. managed to keep up yet. I'm always slightly behind in where I'm trying to do. <laughs> but um, no, experiences that might have pointed me in this direction. Um, I, I, I have campaigned against and written and lectured against the keeping of, of primates as pets. Um, but I will be honest, the first non-human primate that I met up close and personal was a, a friend's pet spider monkey called Twiggy, um, who lived in a house in the avenues in Hull. <laughs> well, I, I lived in a different house, not far away. And uh, um, Pablo Stern and his big brother Carl um, were, were school friends and they had seen a, a little spider monkey in a pet shop which was commonplace in in, the, in those days um, and bought it because they were sorry for it not thinking it through that if they do that then the pet owner having made a profit will go and get another one and that will send a word out to some trapper somewhere in in south america who will go out and capture another one often by killing the mother because you can't get baby monkeys just like that um but obviously as a child in in all that wasn't part of our thinking um so that interaction with uh, a non-human primate um was was wonderful seeing a spider monkey's tail the end of which has um, bare skin with whorls like a fingerprint on it so that they can wrap that tail around a branch in a prehensile way giving them a fifth limb and and you know feeling insecure they just reach up with their tail and wrap it around you and and, and feel more secure because they're held on ah that, that was that was, yeah. was quite something and then yeah, um, fascinating and, and the, the life forms that i brought into my into my bedroom capturing you know keeping tadpoles in jars and watching them grow into frogs and caterpillars, watching them pupate, and then out comes a moth or a butterfly. It, it is, it is, it fills you with wonder. So it is wonderful in the very literal sense of that. But as far as many of those animals are concerned, I was a predator because I brought them into my room. I wasn't necessarily very good at keeping them alive, so my fascination was stimulated, but often at the expense of the animal. Uh, Sometimes I, I, you know, bred moths through several generations, several cycles, um, which was again wonderful. But ultimately, things that I brought in to study died. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. so yeah, it's it's funny, funny you should tell the story there about the monkey because it reminds me. Uh, you've reminded me actually about my my mum. Her brother was in the merchant navy, and so this oh, crikey, I don't even like to say West. 40s maybe 40s possibly and um he was in the merchant navy and he arrived home one day with with a been to south africa i think it was and he arrived with a monkey in his bag uh and th there's loads of tales about this monkey jumping around in in the lounge and um so i i, I guess it was more, much more probably more common then was it because there wasn't the same controls and people were just going out in these exotic countries, perhaps in the merchant navy as an example, and bringing back all sorts. Yes, uh, and life at sea can be very lonely. So having a, a companion animal can make that much easier. Yeah. And that continues yeah. to be a case today. A few years ago, I was looking into the illegal trade in baby uh, apes in particular, but other species out of interest, um, in in Boma, which is a port on the mouth of the River Congo in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, I, I had previously, on, on earlier investigations, heard of sailors coming inland and buying baby gorillas, baby chimpanzees. And, and I can see that if you're spending weeks at sea, then having a, an intelligent companion animal is, is, is um, very gratifying. Um, but of course, to feed that demand, uh, hunters who don't have uh, other ways necessarily of earning money um, will go into the forest and kill a mother ape. And, and usually if it's a gorilla or a chimpanzee, the father and any other members of the group that get in the way to get that baby. So it's a very destructive uh, practice. And so I was in, in Boma um, asking around 
if anyone knew of people who sold uh, apes. And a guy who, who was serving in a restaurant uh, where we were having a, a drink, looking out over the the ships that were moored offshore. Boma isn't a very big port. They haven't got many places to tie up a, a big cargo ship. Um, so they, they wait offshore. And he said, oh, you want to talk to the washman? I said, who, who are the washmen? <laughs> I said, oh, well, they're, they're the young sort of streetwise guys who, who paddle out in canoes to the boats that are waiting offshore where the sailors are not allowed to come ashore because they haven't got a, a visa. So they've been at sea for weeks and they end up sitting on a boat just away from the land and they can't go and have, live it up in town because they haven't got a visa. So the washmen come out and, and basically take a shopping list. So you want fresh meat or vegetables, uh, you want a girl for the night, you want a, a, a pet to keep on board, they'll paddle back to shore in their canoe and, and go and get it for you and, and bring it out and, and make a fair old profit in, in the... So, okay, uh, where do we find some washmen? We went into town and uh, two young guys... Um, were found for us by this helpful chap and they, they said uh, they didn't mind answering some questions you buy them a drink have a chat and uh, I said you know, do the sailors ever ask you to get some oh yes yeah yeah apparently Russian sailors often ask for crocodiles well I guess if you, you again if you're living at sea you want a companion animal you want something that reflects your your uh, status <laughs> and maybe a, a pet crocodile is just what you need lots of teeth and, um so they hadn't been asked to get any baby apes but they said oh if you want a baby gorilla i know there's one for sale that was their job to know what was for sale where so i said yeah we'd be interested um i didn't tell him that we would get the vendor arrested but uh, i said yeah it would be interesting I'd like to see that yeah yeah and we went off and came back yeah 400 dollars. oh i mean that's very cheap for a baby ape um so we go off to to see the baby gorilla and as we're approaching um it looks like a baby chimpanzee okay yes taxonomy is not the strong point of um these vendors um and the lady comes out with she says oh you you, you want to you're interested in buying a baby chimpanzee but after a moment looking at this um it became apparent that it was actually a baby bonobo so much less common a less well-known species of ape um, the same genus as chimpanzees, but with some key differences. The, the hair is parted down the middle. They have sort of red lips and a dark face, um, but very cute. But a much higher pitched voice, a little squeaky voice that they have. Um, and this baby bonobo didn't like being dragged out and shown to people. Uh, it was a bit nervous, but it was obviously a family pet. And I said to this lady on realizing that it was a bonobo, I said, well, you know, your children are going to be very sad because she had two gorgeous little girls. She sold hair extensions in a little boutique on the side of the road. Yeah. You know, a corrugated iron and wood shack, but selling hair paraphernalia. And uh, her little girls were beautifully turned out, as cute as you could. And, and this was their, their pet. And that it wasn't in chains or being mistreated. It was a member of the family. And I said, your kids are going to be really sad if... if and she said, oh, it's all right. I know a lady in Matadi. I'll get another one. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so we said, um, well, we're not going to buy it today. We, we'll come back tomorrow. And we went away and had a think. And I was with um, a lady who was the country representative of the Bonobo Conservation Initiative. And Evelyn said, well, if we go in there with the officials and, and sort of boots and uniforms and confiscate them and arrest people, um, we will be, these children are going to see us as the conservationists as the bad guys because it just disrupted their family life. So she said, well, why don't we take the family, explain to them that what they're doing is illegal, but take them to the bonobo sanctuary outside of Kinshasa with their bonobo and let them see it handed over and then see that it was going to have a better life with other bonobos um, because obviously uh, as that young ape grows up, once uh, this was a she, but if it was a he, that the hip puberty and things start getting very difficult keeping an ape in a household. And whilst it's been the, the subject of many amusing books, the kind of books I used to read as a child, mm. you know, all, all the people who brought animals from back from overseas and lived with them in their house, uh, from from individuals with one animal to to Gerald Durrell who built a zoo doing that. Um, that was my reading matter as a child, and. It's sort of what you did with nature was bring it home and have fun, not thinking it through. Um, so 
yeah, the next day we went back with officials and they said, well, you, you better stay out of this. We'll go in and explain to them. And obviously it was a difficult decision, uh, a difficult realization for them. Oh, wait a minute. These people who were going to give us $400 and then we'd go and get another one and have a bit of spare money uh, are actually going to arrest us unless we hand over. So it was confiscated. But confiscating an ape and moving it around the country is on the endangered species list. So, so you need a permit for that. It needs to have a veterinary check. And I didn't have money in my pocket for that kind of thing. So I rang up Will Travers, who's the president of the Born Free Foundation, one of the founders, and said, Will, um, we've got this baby bonobo. Uh, we need to confiscate it. There are costs involved, veterinary inspection, paperwork. Da -da -da -da. It's going to cost $500 to get this bonobo to a sanctuary. He said, right, you know, we'll cover it. Thanks, Will. It's good having friends like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so so <clears throat> we, we took this bonobo and it went to an office and there's someone who's sitting at an old typewriter going click, 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 click. And, and Evelyn said, oh, I can do it faster than that. So she starts typing and I'm sitting holding the baby, literally. <laughs> <laughs> the video of this, I can, show, I can show, give you the link. Um, and the, the oh, baby... Yes looking up at me uh, and I'm doing a piece to camera because I'm holding my camera in my hand saying well uh, you know conservation takes time there's paperwork to do and there's click 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 in the background and the bonobo as I'm talking looking up and starts talking to me and interacting because it's a baby primate and they look at whoever's caring for them and and imitate and and interact with and and that connection is is very powerful which is mm. exactly why when someone sees a baby primate and they get to hold it and it hangs on to them you think, oh my goodness this baby needs me how much does it cost right and then you're, you're driving the trade yeah that absolutely the same passion that, that pushes me to fight for conservation is the same passion that someone who who is is wanted by a helpless baby primate or or other animal exotic animal um drives that trade which is so destructive and I think we have to recognize that. And I think as someone who used to want to keep animals, I can see why, because they are fascinating. And particularly for the, the higher mammals that interact with you or the really cool animals like uh, reptiles, you know, I can empathize with the, the Russian sailor who's bored at sea and wants something interesting to fill his spare time. But then you have to say to that person, hey, I've been there, I understand that, but just look at the knock-on effect of your purchase. Somebody else is going to go out and catch another one. And, and those species cannot stand a potentially limitless global market. So, yeah, I spend a lot of time campaigning. So, so, so it's obviously a, absolutely. So, so it's obviously a big education process as much as anything, isn't it? It's really important. It's hard to believe in the modern age, actually, that um, we know with specifically now with that thing called the Internet, that people aren't aware of these issues. But is it fair to say that there's still people not aware of it or are they aware of it, but they put their own arguably selfish needs first? Well, uh, yes, they do. And again, that sounds like I'm, I'm demonizing someone who's just pursuing their particular passion, which is for keeping and, and being wowed by uh, uh, exotic animals um and tinternet as you alluded is is a two-edged sword because yes you can find out stuff but you can sell stuff yeah uh, uh, just just last year uh, someone asked me if i knew when there's a new zoo opening in dubai and and there were uh, and it's uh, no expense spared it's going to be a world-class way of keeping animals in captivity um which philosophically i, I find um unacceptable now i, I think you know, taking animals from a life in the wild where they're fulfilling all that they evolved to do um and then putting them in a basically a concrete yard with fancy bits to try and keep them entertained uh, so that we have them to look at it, it's as wrong as me keeping a tadpole in my bedroom and then finding out that if you don't know how to look after them they die um so getting better at keeping things in your bedroom which is eff effectively what zoos are <laughs> on a, a grander <laughs> and scale say, oh i've got to bring these animals and show them to everyone <laughs> and hey it turns out people will pay money to see these things and suddenly you've got a, an industry um i think it's that same urge but the consequence of that is that animals are killed 
to be captured for the, the wild animal trade, and whether it's going to be a pet or, or a, a zoo animal or an entertainment. Um, I mean, it, it's ironic that, uh, uh, yeah, let me tell you about the ooh ah ha 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 hypothesis. Okay. Oh, that, that's got to be a story I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> It's about the three C's of human nature. And the first one we've just been talking about, curiosity. You know, I'm a big fan of R Rudyard Kipling's writing. And you'll remember in the Just So stories that the elephant's child has a, an insatiable curiosity, which Kipling spells satiable curiosity because he's mimicking a child's inability to say insatiable curiosity. But that's what we're all blessed with. And, and what we tell our kids, you know, mm. learn about the world go out and be curious and when you see something for the first time what are you going to say oh ooh, look at that oh it's an, a, a human response and when you see a child with wide eyebrows go up oh and very often followed by i want one how can i have one of those but that's the curiosity and we encourage our children to be curious and then if you see an interesting animal particularly if you get to hold it almost immediately you go into compassion mode, the second C. So curiosity, very important in human nature. Compassion, it's one of the things that makes us human and other species share that, but anyway. So compassion, what do you see when you when you embrace something like a, a puppy or a kid? Ah, ah, isn't it nice? You, you, even if you don't embrace it, you're just looking at it, you, ah. So there's the ooh, there's the ah. What's the third one? Comedy. Because if you have a, an animal in your charge, almost immediately you, it's going to do things that make you laugh. Ha ha ha! And it's very easy to laugh when you're seeing a oh. puppy falling over. So, so your curiosity is triggered, your compassion is triggered, and then your comedic response, which makes you laugh. Ooh, ah, ha ha ha! And when you spend time hanging out with non-human primates, what are the sounds you hear a lot? Ooh, ooh, ooh! Ah. <laughs> when, you, when you see a, a baby ape tickled by its parents or its playmate, they laugh. And the, their open mouth laughing expression is very similar to a you know, The scientists call it a play face and they are play chuckles. Um, but that vocalization is an expression of, of, of pleasure uh, and, and it's contagious. So, so laughter is one of those things. And it made me think, well, these are the three vocalizations that are part of those three C's of human nature, um, curiosity, compassion, and comedy. But then if you have something that elicits that, or if you yourself are able to elicit those responses, you watch a stand-up comedian on stage and he's got an audience all falling about with laughter. And, and that gives you a very positive feedback. If, if you if you can elicit um, compassion, then then you have a talent. You can be an actor. You can make people cry just by pretending to express emotions. Um, and because everyone's curious about something, if, if you've got a baby primate like like your relative who brought a monkey back, you know, um, <laughs> why are the barrel organ you know, playing their barrel organ in the streets? They might get a small crowd with the music, but if they got a monkey on top, people are Ooh, look at that. So you've got the ooh, ah, ha, ha, ha can be, become part of that, that fourth C of human nature, commercial. Commerce. If you've got something that can elicit those responses, you've got, you've got a way of making money. Make money from it. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. That's what, that's what our, our mutual friend Spence does. He, he gets people in front of large audiences and they pay money to enjoy going, ooh, ah, ha, ha, ha. Um, but I think that those vocalizations probably hark back to the earliest days of our species when we hadn't got such a rich vocabulary and we were just sharing emotions with each other. So I think the reason that that is such a primal response to something that stimulates your, your uh, curiosity or your compassion or your comedic um, reaction, the comedy, is, is because it's it's deep within our species, our, our DNA, that we respond like that. So my ooh, ah, ha, ha, ha hypothesis is that the reason <laughs> those vocalizations are so like what other primates uh, sound like is because they are our, our human 
vocabulary from from way back before we became the loquacious humans that we are now and can spend an hour rabbiting on in front of a microphone <laughs> that, that's amazing that is amazing uh, that that's a, that's a takeaway for me straight away Ian. that <laughs> i'll remember that forever um do you think sometimes i mean obviously you, you've been in these in these places in these communities is there ever a bit of a conflict between <clears throat> excuse me is there any a bit of a conflict between local people trying to survive versus the needs of the natural world versus obviously what you might call the poachers or the hunters is there any kind of conflict between those uh, issues in terms of you know trying to survive trying to get my trying to make basically make sure that my family is looked after or my family eats so which is a natural thing we all do in even in this country in, in any country it's a natural yeah. thing. But then you've got that versus the profit profiteering element, which, of course, is a whole different thing. Uh, Does that I think create any really, conflict? It's, it's a huge uh, dilemma because mm. if you're a compassionate person, you care about people too. Mm. And, and I, mm. I, particularly on the, um, the response um, blocks on... on on social media where people type in their reaction you you see very much the the worst of human nature when someone writes an article about some of the awful things that people do to animals the people who are compassionate for the animal are saying string them up lock them up throw away the keys shoot the poachers well wait a minute th these are people here and i have i have seen yeah. both sides of that um and i i urge people not to demonize poachers and in fact given that the the skill set that a good poacher has is very close to the skill set that a good ranger has they love being out in the forest they can follow animals that they they um they would make an ideal ranger and, and often the best rangers are poachers turned gamekeeper um so i don't want to shoot them i want to hire them and convert them and give them a, a uniform and obviously a very strict condition. If they've broken the law, they have to pay the penalty. But if they are given an amnesty, which can only be done by the, <clears throat> the government authority, um, and where that has happened, we've got sometimes some of the, the best, most motivated rangers, and they know where the poachers operate and what the tricks of the trade are. So they, they are ideal. <laughs> so <clears throat> to, to, to talk about that, that dilemma between understanding someone's need to feed their family and and it's particularly okay let's go back 44 years we're in we're in december now um so last month 44 years ago i was starting at the karasoki research center in rwanda close to the what was then the zaire border but zaire then became the democratic republic of congo but i i went to work with diane fossey who many people will have heard of today because her, her life work was made into a movie called Gorillas in the Mist. Although yes. a younger generation of people that I talk to now in schools in either never heard of it or it's an old movie. Well, it's not an old movie, it was just made the other day, but it was made in 1988. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Young yeah, people, yeah. it's quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any road up. Um, <laughs> so I, um, when I was at university, I took on the task of organizing speakers for the biology society why did i do that because if you heard of someone doing interesting work you'd write to them um and it would sometimes be a typewriter but for me it was more likely to be you'd write to them because i, I didn't really learn to type until i got to karisoki uh, and invite them to come and speak and they would and so you'd meet them and hear about their work and and um one such person was a, a scientist called sandy harcourt and Sandy had just spent two years studying gorillas with Diane Fossey and was at Cambridge writing up his PhD. And I heard about him and dropped him a line. And yeah, he came and gave a talk about gorillas. Fantastic. I put him up in my flat overnight and picked his brains and got Diane Fossey's neo box number and some advice. And Sandy said, well, it's in the middle of a forest, is his hut. So if something breaks, it stays broken. So if you can mend things, you should mention that. And, and it just happily turns out that I'm a compulsive fixer. I can't help fiddling with things to try and put them right if they've gone wrong. Um, 
And he said, don't mention my name because he and I had fallen out big time and it wouldn't be an asset <laughs> in my letter if I said, oh, Sandy Harcourt said I should write. So, OK, thanks, Sandy. Um, <laughs> I sent off this letter to Rwanda saying, basically, um, <clears throat> my academic supervisors don't rate me very highly. And I was honest about that, which apparently was quite a surprise. Diane was used to getting letters from people saying, I'm the best in my year. You have to, you know, you, you need my... my yeah, you'll regret it forever if you don't take me on. Yeah. <laughs> so, so having someone yeah. write, say, well, my supervisors don't rate me, but I love animals and I'd, I'd love to come and help. <laughs> and I've travelled, so I don't mind living in the middle of a forest. Um, so I wrote to Diane and said, if you want someone to make the tea or, or mend the roof, mend the roof, you know. <laughs> yeah, get um, that one in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'd be happy to help. And of course, I didn't hear anything for months. And, and like any undergraduate, you're sending off letters. And, and these days, it's all electronic. But then it was literally handwriting letters, put it in the post. And very few actually elicited a reply. Uh, but about six months later, after I'd finished finals, and I think I was still waiting for the results, which weren't terribly good, <laughs> um, I, I was. Um, I was in the TA at the time, in the Territorial Army, in the in the um, RAMC, brackets V, um, on medical cover in Germany because I didn't have any money and, and doing that sort of thing brought in a bit of extra money. So um, the 5th Light Infantry were doing exercises in Camp Vogelsang in Germany, which <laughs> was a fascinating place. It turned out to be a, a Hitler youth camp and all the walls were covered with friezes of Aryan youth doing manly things. Um, but now it's just used as a sort of barracks for training. Uh, and one day I came back after exercises which involved sitting in a foxhole in a wood um, in pouring rain and mud, waiting to be attacked by the enemy, the pretend enemy. And, and medics, when you're out with the infantry, aren't really regarded as proper soldiers. So whereas everyone else has thunder flashes and, and blanks, um, we're just told to shout bang. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to waste the ammunition on you, basically. Oh, uh, because we were just there in case they fell over and hurt themselves or put a bullet through your foot or something and then we'd know what to do. Uh, so, uh, brilliant. Yes, um, you're, you're in your sleeping bag just thinking you're going to get some shut eye and somebody shouts, stand to! You have to unzip, jump out into a muddy foxhole and wait. And then if somebody moves in the bushes, you shout, halt! <laughs> Advance one and be recognised! <laughs> um, and if they didn't respond appropriately, you shout, bang! Okay, so I get back after a night of shouting bang in a foxhole, and on the bed, which is one of those saggy barracks beds where the springs have gone, so in the in the, the dip in the middle of the bed was the kind of letter you dream about, airmail covered in, in the blue and red airmail edges, and covered in stamps with animals all over them, the sort of stamps which as a, a boy um, I collected with glee, uh, and this was from Diane Fossey. And it had come to my home in Beverly, and my mum had posted it on to Camp Vogels. <laughs> so, yes, um, open the letter, and I suspect that the, the Fifth Light Infantry still have this, this, this myth of a bloke leaping around going, ah! because it was very exciting <laughs> to open this letter. So, had you, given, had you given up on it, Ian? Had you, had you kind of yeah, just yeah. thought that's not going to happen? And, and why did it take so long? Did you ever find out? Well, one of the things was that. <laughs> that Karisoki at the time was a collection of little corrugated inch iron shacks at 10,000 feet in the mountains. And, and the post was brought by porters in a box on their head or tucked into their jacket, <laughs> right. carrying the right. supplies right. on their head. Um, so it was like going back to the 19th century where, where all your supplies were carried with a long line of bearers um, carrying things on, on their head. And the system at camp, as I learned when I got there, um, was that you left a, a shopping list and some money on your desk. And when the porters came up, they would take the shopping list and the money and they'd go and they'd deliver any letters from the post box in town and take away your, your letters and post them. So, so communication was slow. There was no radio and there was no internet because it hadn't been invented then. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah. yes, my letter would have gone... Um, to the PO box in town, the um, head porter, Rinder Gaza, would have picked it up and taken it up the mountain with a long line of people carrying potatoes and other vegetables, um, and left it at camp, and Diane would have read it amongst the pile of letters, 
and Diane was a workaholic. She was sitting at her desk typing day and night when she wasn't out watching gorillas or, or being sick because she wasn't very well. Um, and she had this correspondence all over the world, which these days almost we take for granted because email is so easy. We can fire off messages and now even easier with, with, with you know, sending things What's up and yeah, with our, with our thumbs on, on uh, various apps. Um, but then it was, you, you wrote a letter, you put it in a letterbox, a postman picked it up and eventually it got there after it would take maybe two weeks to get there. And then when someone got around to replying it, they wrote their letter and uh, the porters took it down, posted it in the post office and it would make its way there. So you'd expect a round trip correspondence to be about a month. And, and aspiring students who want to come and help aren't at the top of your list of <laughs> letters to reply to. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, the person I was replacing, uh, an American traveler called Tim White, had been hitchhiking in Rwanda, walking on the side of the road with his thumb out, and Diane Fossey stopped and picked him up and gave him a lift for a few miles, but said, look, I'm a bit short-staffed. Have you got any time? Do you want to come and help? And he said, sure, because he was just out to, to experience life. Um, and so Tim went up to help for a couple of weeks. And six months later, he was still there and, and wanted to get on with his travels across Africa. And I was the, <laughs> the, the person that allowed that to happen. Um, so maybe I hadn't thought about this before, but maybe my letter arrived not long after Tim had arrived. And when he started making noises about wanting to leave, Diane dug out the letter from somebody who said they'd like to come and help and could mend roofs. <laughs> And, and wrote back and, and and she said something along the lines of well I, I don't really care about what your supervisors say but if if you're if it's true that you love animals and you, you want to help then you're, you're welcome here and she said something which which lives with me today as a motivation she then said despite the, the lousy weather the bad food the isolation for me the gorillas are the reward and one could never ask for more and their trust and confidence at the end of each working day. Wonderful. And, and do was, you think? Do you yeah. think that the? Um, do you think that your passion for this helped you deal with the downside, as it were? Does the passion almost like take over in terms of the driving force and motivation? Um, in which case, then you're not quite as impacted by the tough physical environment. Yes, but but I I, I enjoy that like I mean, many people go out on weekends and and hike through cold wet rainy mountains and and stay in tents and they feel better for it just being in the wilderness and for some people that's that's not their cup of tea but um you know i, I found <laughs> jumping into a, a foxhole and shouting bang when when the, the so-called enemy approach was was quite entertaining it was a bit of a laugh um so imagine that that someone says, you know, not only are you going to go and get to work with amazing animals, I didn't really connect with what that was on a philosophical level of them being non-human beings, but I, hey, I was going to go and help study gorillas um, and have all the fun that people have when they go out on the hillsides, on the moors in, in Yorkshire or, or elsewhere, other moors are ava available. <laughs> if someone who likes to go out on the Yorkshire moors, then, then um, to, to actually be, I wasn't exactly paid because I was, I was only given enough money for food. Um, but being a, a frugal Yorkshireman whose mother was a DS teacher, domestic science teacher, therefore I knew how to cook. Um, what what some students or researchers at Karisuki saw as a, a limited uh, diet, um, I found it was great. I, I invented all sorts of dishes up there. Um, <laughs> when I was out, studying the gorillas on the way back if there was a bramble thicket i'd, I'd collect blackberries and i'd make blackberry jam um you know <laughs> I, 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 I suppose if i suppose if anybody out there the young and younger ones are out there and then they ask the, in the first couple of days they ask the question where's the nearest mcdonald's you know you're probably <laughs> in trouble at that point yes <laughs>